Hi, and welcome to Community Homeworks class this evening. All about mold. Just what everybody's always wanted to know, because no one wants it in their house. We'd like to thank the generous support of the Kalamazoo Community Foundation, Love Where You Live Environment Fund for helping us provide this program this evening. We do rely on funding from the government, from foundations, and from our viewers to help support our education program here at Community Homeworks. During the show, a place if you choose to donate will scroll across the bottom of the screen. Also an address that if you have any questions after watching this video at a later date, you can send the questions to us and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. Tonight, our program all about mold is presented by Ron Killian standing right here next to me. He is from Service Master and is a mold expert. <laughs> something he probably isn't too proud of. <laughs> He's proud of it, but probably something he doesn't share with everyone. <laughs> So Ron, thank you for coming this evening. And I know you've got lots of information to share with us and some interesting things to show us. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Jean. It is a privilege to talk all about mold tonight. And uh, we've had a great partnership with Community Homeworks through the years and on a lot of projects together. And we're just gonna kind of introduce and uh, give you some information so that you can make good decisions uh, when you run into mold, which is most likely I'm a certified mold remediator. I've been doing it for about 16 years and I'm old enough to be moldy. So we're in good, we're in good company. Um, you know, one that there, there are occupational hazards with this particular industry. Some of them are safety and health related, but uh, then there's other ones. I got a Valentine's Day card and it says Valentine's Day and love is in the air. And open it up and it says along with toxins and carcinogens, flakes of dead skin, dust particles, flying insects, mold spores and killer viruses. Anyway, happy Valentine's. That was from my wife. So when people think of mold, Somehow they all, all also think of me. So we want to look at mold remediation tonight. We're going to go through a lot of information. And, uh, you know, if there's questions along the way, I guess there's a way you, that you can com comment on that. So just a few questions that get the uh, brain matter going here. True or false? If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. Mold, if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. Give that a little thought. Actually, many times you will go down in the basement and you get that musty smell, and that's really something that is an indicator that there are mycotoxins uh, um, or VOCs from, from the mold, and so you may not even be able to see it yet. Number two, it always has an odor. Well, it doesn't always have an odor. I've been in homes where they had a million spores per cubic uh, yard of air, and you couldn't smell anything at all. So that's something that we um, have to take in consideration. It doesn't hurt me, it won't hurt you. Um, very troublesome uh, philosophy. Uh, mold is very subjective. What affects me may not affect you, vice versa. So people in your home, we all have different tolerances towards these um, molds and some people have no tolerance at all and immediately react to that. Um, just clean it and everything will be okay. Um, you know, you might have some mold on the outside of a wall or something of that nature. And so you just put some bleach on it or clean it and you say, okay, well, we're good. But what you don't know is what's on the inside of the wall and is it going to continue? And obviously there's something that needs to be corrected so that the mold stops growing too. So that needs to be taken into consideration. And then just seal it up and everything will be okay. I've been in homes where they sold them, they were highly contaminated with mold and they just put fresh uh, drywall over the old stuff and uh, tried to sell it. Obviously that created um, a real risk factor for the new, the new buyer. And then, okay, it's bad stuff. Send in the contractors and tear it out. And this might be kind of an old fashioned way that people looked at it or maybe homeowner way that you do it but there's some things you need to take in consideration. Um, I was on one job where we were trying to clean up the mold and the contractor came in already to put it back and uh, they were just slash, dash and crash um, and there were mold spores all over and they just had a bandana on and they said everything be okay. Well, they could possibly be um, contaminating the rest of the building. So what does remediation mean? Remediation means to cure or to remedy. 
And with mold remediation, it means to remove the mold without contamination to people in non-contaminated areas. So it truly is an environmental issue and it can spread and can cause other issues, related issues. So as we compare this with water or smoke and odor mitigation, uh, mitigation means to make less severe. So if you had a water intrusion, we would come out and we would set up drying systems and things like that to lessen and also do water extraction to lessen the damage that happens. But with remediation, it means to cure or to remedy. There's great benefits with mold remediation. First of all, we need to be concerned about our health, um, also physically and emotionally. And there's a lot of people who are kind of germophobic and uh, understandably, and a lot of people who are immune compromised. And these are all things that need to be taken in consideration, whether for you or for someone who lives in your home. And then there's going to be less destruction of property if it's properly remediated. And it's going to save money so that it doesn't get into legal issues. So if you wait or fail to remediate the mold, your property damage is going to expand. Uh, there may be some kind of liability that you run into, and worst case scenario, there might be some litigation with both people and property involved. So it's important that you take care of it as soon as you see it. Now, Service Master does uh, free inspections, and what I, what I mean by that is we'll come out and we'll see what your issue is and give you advice and direction on how to take care of it, and I've gotten uh, dozens and dozens of invitations to come and this is what I see. They take me to their shower, their bathtub, and they said, see, there's the mold. So uh, something I want to kind of cue you in right from the beginning is that uh, kind of the rule of thumb is that if it's 10 square feet or less, just make it go away. We don't have to do the testing. We don't have to wear our uh, personal protective equipment, maybe some just to be prudent, but we don't have to go through all the hoops in order to do it properly. So when you run into a situation like this in your bathroom or whatever, there's some great products. Just um, one of them is a Tilex spray, comes in a squirt bottle. Uh, there's another one that I've tried just recently at Meyer, and it's a mold spray, and it does it does excellent. And you probably could just spray it on something like this, and it would probably just disappear. Where it goes, we don't know because we don't test before or after on that. But for the smaller um, instances of mold, then that would be best. So uh, 10 square feet or less. I've got a piece of paneling here. I want to show you and if you look real close down at the bottom there's just a couple of black spots right there so you know is that a concern for mold it's certainly under 10 square feet isn't it but if i turn it over you can see that on the back of that paneling the moisture had wicked up quite a while quite a bit and there was uh, extensive mold growth on there and based on its appearance it could even be some of the bad mold so you always need to consider when you find mold, what's going on, what's causing the moisture, and uh, what, what you need to do to kind of rectify that and, and change it. So here's an illustration. It looks like a Tom and Jerry a cartoon here, but you can see that the technician cut out just a little bit of the drywall there because we found mold behind the baseboard. So it wasn't properly mitigated or dried down fast enough, and there was enough moisture there to grow so that it, it grew between the baseboard and the wall board. And when we pulled the baseboard off, we could tell there was mold there. Now, right in this picture, that's less than 10 square feet, and we could probably just treat that with a topical, but we wanted to be sure that there was, something wasn't going on behind it, like the piece of paneling that I just showed you. So sometimes we'll try to get a little opening, maybe put a snake camera up in there and make sure that it hadn't kind of migrated up the back of the wall board so that we aren't leaving anything undone. In this photo, you can see that um, the technician has found that there was a kind of a hot spot. By a hot spot, I mean that our moisture meters kept telling us that there's some kind of mold or moisture in, in the wall there. Uh, on the insurance uh, agents or companies want us to dry down, you know, a water damage in about three days. 
And uh, if it goes beyond that, they're like, just tear it out because they don't want to go into mold remediation. Uh, some insurance companies cover a portion of that. Some don't touch it all. And uh, you may want to check your, your insurance policy on that to see if you have coverage for it. But in this particular instance, uh, we could tell with our very sophisticated moisture meters that there was still trapped moisture in that wall. So we opened it up and sure enough, we found the mold. And now it went from a water mitigation into a mold remediation project. Now, you don't see this much, but I'm just showing you some pictures of some of the homes that I've inspected and uh, how radically contaminated they are. Um, if you're living in a house like this, get out immediately. Stop this <laughs> viewing this and go find a place, a safe place to stay. And uh, you can see here that the moisture wicked up to the four foot mark on the drywall at the seam there. And so it's more contaminated down at the bottom than the top. And you can see in this picture that they did have a water uh, intrusion and they did a flood cut. You see the bare studs there down by the floor. And I don't really know what happened. This was kind of an abandoned home when, when we um, inspected it. And yet it was very obvious that it was uh, grossly contaminated and needed remediation. This is another home that we went to. And again, another abandoned home and uh, they couldn't tell what the cause of it of the moisture was uh, they thought maybe there was a door leaking on the upper level um, this indicates that there was a lot more moisture than that at that particular time so again um, here's a cutaway of that same uh, building that i just showed you and you can see where the mold is growing on the framing so it has to be investigated. We have to go two feet past where we see mold to see if it stopped or not, or whether it continued in some form, either behind the wall or somewhere along the line. So here's another picture of mold. It's very colorful at times. Uh, I'll just make a comment about black mold. Black mold is a toxigenic mold, but there's about 10,000 different black molds, and you don't know if it's toxigenic without having it tested. And many times you'll see bright colors, red, greens, yellows, whites, all kinds of things. Um, we as uh, mold remediators get all excited about these photos. We even have a, a magazine with the mold of the month in it. So, <laughs> All right, so what is mold? Let's talk about it. Is it a plant? All right, well, plants don't move under their own power. They make their own food using chlorophyll. Okay, and they produce oxygen and use carbon dioxide. All right, they have thick, uh, thick cell walls, usually made of cellulose. So is mold a plant? All right, is mold an animal? Well, what do animals do? Animals can move under their own power. All right, they feed on plants or other animals. Um, they use oxygen and produce carbon dioxide, just the opposite of plants and they have a digestive system. So what is mold? Until 1950s, uh, they couldn't decide and then they made a whole new kingdom for it, the fungi or fungi kingdom. I like to think of myself as a fun guy, but fungi also can be used. So it's not mobile under its own power. It feeds on organic materials. It uses oxygen and uh, a few other things that you'd be familiar with, okay? Where do you find mold? Um, mushrooms, uh, something you left too long in the refrigerator. Yeast is a form of mold. Um, some uh, saprophytic molds uh, that live on us would be like athlete's foot, things of that nature. And uh, basically it's nature's recycling agents. I've heard people claim that if we didn't have mold, we'd be walking on trash and touching the moon. I don't know if that's feasible or not, but so taking another look, moisture or mold needs moisture. Um, it produces spores and then the spores swell and develop a hyphae or kind of a stem and that kind of blossoms and grows, grows greater. And that's when it becomes visible so it's invisible most of the time. And then it secretes enzymes to digest um, other materials. So we see that uh, mold releases microbial VOCs, volatile organic compounds from their, from their digestion. 
And that's what you uh, would smell when you go down the basement steps or something like that. You're, you're smelling the MVOCs from the digestion of the mold. So I want to talk just briefly about types of mold. There's 100,000 different types or species. Um, common locations in our homes are, you know, moldy bread, moldy cheese, mold in the shower, nail fungus, athlete's foot. We mentioned earlier, um, you've probably run into it different places. When I do a home inspection, I check every nook and corner, especially any place where there is plumbing or a potential moisture intrusion in the foundation, up in the attic, if there's a roofing leak, things of that nature. So usually it's connected in some way with some kind of a moisture source on that. And when I talk to people, I talk about categories of mold and I, I break them into two categories. The first one is the scary one and that's a toxigenic mold. And that's gonna cause mucosal irritation, nose uh, fatigue, headache, chest tightness, pulmonary, immunological, neurological, oncological disorders. Kind of sounds like COVID, doesn't it? Um, but it really affects people differently. Everybody reacts differently and it's extremely hard to diagnose if you have a given mold allergy. There are specialists out there, but most general practitioners and you know primary doctors, things like that, haven't had a lot of training or don't have a lot of testing uh, options for for that. So it can be hard to uh, actually you know say for sure. And then there's the more common kinds of mold that we call allergenic, and they're going to cause an allergy, an asthma type reaction, a hay fever type symptoms like itchy, watery eyes, itchy, runny nose, sneezing, coughing, hives, or radish, throat closing. There's one particular mold that gets me every time. We don't even have to test when we find it or I walk into a building and all of a sudden my throat becomes kind of hoarse and my throat kind of closes up and all of a sudden I'm I'm not gasping for air or anything like that, but my voice gets real scratchy. And uh, those are the kind of symptoms that people have with the allergenic type molds, which are very common. So where do you find mold? Outdoors, it's uh, natural. Uh, we don't really have too many people who go outside and say, I can't breathe, or they feel like they're being bombarded by molds. Now, there are some environments like maybe a muggy day in the south or something like that where that could happen. But uh, most of the time we encounter uh, in, in a troublesome way with mold indoor, and that's not natural. So I don't know how many of you are from Irish descent, but uh, that kind of hints way back that a uh, long time ago there was uh, a mold plague on the potatoes in in Ireland and there was a food shortage and that's when many people, uh, some of my forefathers, migrated to the United States. This was back in July 17, 2010, right here in our Kalamazoo Gazette front page that uh, fungus hits potatoes and tomatoes. So it's something that still happens today. I want to talk just a minute about health effects uh, from mold. And uh, you've maybe heard of the curse of the um, curses on, on the Egyptian tombs. And I'm just going to read this to you. The tombs of ancient Egypt were famous for curses that threaten death to anyone who enters. And the opening of many tombs have resulted in mysterious sicknesses and often death for the explorers. The most notorious case occurred when the tomb of King Casimir was opened in Poland in April 1973. Within a few days, only two of the 12 researchers present were still alive. One of the remaining survivors per performed microbiological examinations of the tomb. He found three traces he found traces of three species of fungus <clears throat> on the artifact that had been taken from the tomb. Aspergillus flavus, Penicillium rubrum, and Penicillium rugulosum. These fungi produce aphatoxins B1 and B2 and are speculated to have caused the deaths of the 10 researchers. It has also been speculated that these fungi may have been responsible for the death of Lord Carnarvon, who died a few months after exploring King Tut's tomb in 1922. That's kind of scary, isn't it? So here you have a mold, there's no, there's no moisture. At one point there was in some kind of decomposition. And here you have a, 
a tomb that's been closed for X amount of hundreds of years or whatever. And when they open it, there's a mold spore in there that's toxigenic. And they surmise that it killed 10 of the people that were there as they breathed it in when they opened this tomb. Uh, you may have heard of the uh, Salem witch trials. And uh, this was back early in our history too. And there were women in this very um, conservative uh, village and they were having all kinds of hallucinations and all. It was kind of their theological bent or whatever that this women had uh, been dabbling in the occult and that they were being controlled by other forces and they didn't know what to do, so they hung them. Um, later research showed that it was probably a mold in their rye bread that caused kind of an LSD reaction, and uh, they just didn't understand that. So there are some very important things to consider regarding health, your personal health when you're counter mold. Now, having said that, let's back down a little bit here and kind of move into um, we talked about these mycotoxins that mold emit. All right. So there's visible mold and there's invisible mold and you can smell the invisible mold and people who are at risk are infants because their systems haven't developed yet. <sighs> Seniors because they've been compromised. Anybody immune suppressed and then people with asthma and allergies. Uh, some people with cancer, too, are, are maybe a little more susceptible. So what does mold look like? Now, it just shows you a bunch of pictures, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but they're microscopic plants. What you see is a colony, actually. You could not see probably a mold, you know, plant with the naked eye. Um, spores are the reproductive seeds of the mold, and they take different times in order to grow. It it, it feeds, uh, it needs uh, food and water and different temperatures to grow. And uh, it, it's ubiquitous. It's in every room, it's, it's outside, it's in every environment. Um, it's part of our environment. Some of them are hydrophilic, meaning that they need a lot of moisture in order to grow. Some of them are right in the middle. They don't need as much. And some of them grow in very dry conditions. So you'll find mold just about every place in our world. It usually takes about 48 to 72 hours before you see or smell it. So let's just say you had a water intrusion, you did your best, you mopped up or whatever, you know, maybe you didn't get it properly mitigated. And now about three days later, uh, this happens lots of times when we have our floods here in town and people call us out and all they want us to do is to kind of remove the moisture. They don't want us to set up drying equipment, things like that because of the expense. And then they call us back in a couple of days and they say, boy, it smells down there and I've got mold. So that's why insurance companies want us to do this very aggressive drying um, in the three in the first initial three days to see if we can stop that from happening. So again, it takes a couple of days for it to make itself known. Um, some of the temperature requirements, some are psychrophilic um, and some are meaning uh, kind of cold. Some are mesophilic, different temperatures kind of in the middle and some like it really hot. So again, mold is uh, very powerful and it grows logarithmic rate. You know, two plus two is four, four plus four is eight, eight plus eight is 16. Well, it grows two times two is four, four times four is 16, 16 times 16 is, I can't even tell you, but that's how it grows. And uh, so it, it grows very, very quickly. And that's why we need to address it as soon as we can. Um, here's kind of the colonization rates that we see. And uh, you can see number five and six there. Those are the real common um, allergenic molds, aspergillus and penicillium. Uh, I don't know if I've ever been on a job that didn't have aspergillus or penicillium on it. And then you see number nine down there, you see stachybotrys. Well, that's the toxigenic mold. And you can see that it takes longer for it to colonize. So when we run into that, that's an indicator that it's been there longer than suspected and that there's been some moisture source that went unnoticed or untreated. And so once we run into the toxigenic mold, uh, kind of have to change the protocol because things aren't um, as easily remediated.
Yes, we have a question. We have a question from Dorothy. Dorothy wants to know what invades books and other paper goods which are kept in a humid basement. Is that mold or mildew? And is mildew different? She said, I can never see it, but I can smell it. My understanding, all right, is that mold and mildew are the same or twin sisters. So, you know, uh, sometimes they say mildew grows on certain things and mold grows on other things. They try to distinguish it a little bit, but it is still, uh, you know, a fungus and it's growing on it. It definitely will give you that old musty smell for sure. And when we get to what to do about it, uh, we can give you a little bit of advice on how to treat that. Thanks for that question. So let's talk about these mold spores. Um, they are five to mic seven microns big. Now, put a dot on your paper with your pen or in newsprint, and that's 100 microns right there, that little period. Right, our human hair is 70 plus or minus microns. On the top, minus, uh, minus 70 minus on the side is 70 plus. Then the eye can't see below 50 microns, so we lose sight. So going back up to the top, a mold spore is five to seven microns. We can't see below 50 microns. So it's really hard, isn't it, to remove or clean what you can't see. So it's very detailed and it's very uh, structured cleaning. And there's equipment and engineering controls that we use and personal protective equipment that we use in order to, to do that because uh, there's probably more in the air than what you can see. So kind of keep that in mind. All right, then the transportation of molds, they're, they're very aerodynamic. If we were to have dropped the mold spore, which we couldn't see, obviously, but if we were to stop, if we were to drop it, an hour later, it would have only fall, fallen about three feet. Now that's if nobody walked by and the furnace didn't come on and suck it in there and blow it around the house or whatever. So indoor, indoor airflow is gonna affect it. And then settled spores wait for food and water. At my house, uh, I always have mold in the basement bathroom shower. My wife has the nice, you know, bathroom upstairs and I got the single one downstairs. And it always grows right by the uh, soap dish because that's always stays damp right there. And uh, I do have a exhaust vent while I'm showering, but I probably should put it on timer, let it run a little bit more so it would dry quicker. But there's mold in every room of my house, but it's just looking for water. And when it gets down to my shower, it's, aha, I've arrived. So then mold reactivates where it left off, again, in that logarithmic rate. So let's just say you had some mold, maybe it was on the drywall, you wiped it off, you didn't realize there was that much more behind it, and a very similar water intrusion, maybe it's even a foundation, water intrusion behind the wall or something occurs, well, maybe you had 50,000 spores there and it starts over again, 50,000 times 50,000, and that's how, that's how it kind of grows. Talk about the life cycle of mold, uh, remove food or, food or water and mold will become dormant. All right, dormant means sleeping, active means growing, dead doesn't mean dead. Uh, I actually have chemicals that we use, uh, kind of proprietary chemicals that kill the cell wall of a mold spore. Um, and yet if it's left in the home, it's still an irritant and people, um, you know, who don't get along with that particular mold are still going to react to that. So it has to be removed. So dormant, active, or dead, they still give off mycotoxins, and that's why it has to be removed. So should it be removed? Um, probably one of the earliest guidelines was the New York City guidelines, and it came out of their public schools so a janitor might find mold around a drinking fountain or something like that. He could just wipe it down. And yet if it became troublesome or kept coming back or the area around it started growing, then what are they going to do? So a bunch of specialists and professionals got together and they wrote the new New York City guidelines, which is basically not, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the nine square feet, you know, is you can take care of it yourself. Then there are EPA guidelines at the end of my presentation. I'll leave up the EPA um, address that you can look at. And then there's certification classes. Actually, the very first mold remediation protocol 
is found in Leviticus chapter 14. And uh, you'd be amazed if you read that. Um, you don't even have to hire a professional. It's all spelled out there what you're supposed to do. And uh, they did the same thing that we do today, um, except instead of having a, a mold professional or a hygienist come in to inspect, they had their priests come in and take a look at it. And then they closed things up and did some cleaning and came back. Uh, priests came back to see and if it was gone, then that was the end of it. If it wasn't, they tore down the building. So kind of interesting. Um, we go by the IICRC standard and reference guide for professional mold remediation. This is our Bible. So um, if we do anything, we want to be sure that it, it lines up with the procedures outlined here. Um, this is the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning and Restoration Certification. And uh, I've actually uh, sat a couple of times uh, expert witness um, with people who had problems and as it went to court, I always referred to this standard and gave them the understanding of the reading of that standard as to what the procedure should have been in the remediation process. So let's talk just about detection and assessment here a little bit. So first the thing you want to do is uh, find and fix the water source. You know, even when I go home into a home, many times I look behind the toilet tank because lots of times it will kind of weep during the warm weather and that's just enough moisture for mold to start growing there. So any place that there's uh, moisture or any place there could be a moisture intrusion, as I mentioned up in the attic, down in the basement, basins, basements are notorious for it because they're below grade and there's even little different temperatures and vapor variables and all kinds of things that go on. But uh, first of all, fix the water source if you can. Uh, locate the mold. Where is the food supply? Uh, mold likes anything cellulosic, so anything wood or drywall. They do make a drywall that has a fiberglass backing on it now. It costs a few more dollars per sheet, but you can use that in uh, high moisture areas and it, it will retard or stop the growth on the backside because there's no paper on it. Um, and then where is or was the water? Um, sometimes when we get to, or many times when we come to a mold remediation job, it's a good time to uh, include a hygienist or a specialist in that, um, especially if there's going to be maybe liability issues. Maybe it's in a public building or church or a school or something like that, and there'd be people, all different kinds of people that could respond and react to different kinds of mold. It'd be good to have hygienists come in and give some professional help. And there always needs to be proof that the problem exists and that it's been resolved. And I'll just take a minute to talk about that. On any mold project over 10 square feet that we do, we always have the environment tested uh, with air samples. So I'll show you in a minute a pump that they use just to collect air on a, on a capsule and they send it into a laboratory and the lab technicians take the hard powered microscopes here. And every mold spore has a signature so they can say, okay, this is uh, aspergillus, this is penicillium, this is, you know, and, and they count them on that slide. And then they have a formula based on how much air they collected of how much there would be in the cubic yard of air. And then there's thresholds as far as what's normal and what's abnormal, what needs to be addressed and if there's a problem or not. So does the problem exist? So we always have these tests taken at the beginning of a project. And then we always have them taken at the end of the project to show that we were successful in remediating it and getting rid of the mold. And then you have documentation that if you're ever going to sell your house or whatever, you have to disclose if you ever had a water problem or this or that. And uh, if you're ethical and honest, you would have to say so. And then you could give that documentation to them and say, yeah, but we had a professional remediate in here and the results on that. So these tests run about $200 each. And most of the time they take three per time. So they'll take one in the affected area, they'll take one in the uh, unaffected area to find out if the mold spores have gone through the HVAC system or anything like that. And then they always take a sample outside. And many times uh, these lab technicians will care, compare what's inside to outside, and that'll maybe give them an idea whether there's an issue or not. Let's say you live around the lake. There might be higher, you know, um, 
readings outside and in some other place or deep in the woods, something like that. So then there's a spore count before and after. So here's the pump that they use. And uh, up in the left-hand corner there, you can see a little capsule taped to the wall. And basically it's a little vacuum pump. So it's just sucking air through that capsule. And there's a median there collecting all those spores and that gets capped and sent to the uh, laboratory. It usually takes two or three days for the test results to come back. So again, if uh, especially service master, I mean, we have to protect our reputation and we have to be completely professional and uh, you know you might say well no i understand there's a risk factor here and all of that but uh, I, I don't want to do testing well if that happened we'd have you sign a waiver so that you couldn't come back and later on say that we did something that um, we didn't recommend um, you may not be able to read this but um, i think you can um, one of those houses that I showed you, this was the actual test that was taken. And you can see the Penicillium aspergillus that there were 513 spores on that slide. And for the cubic yard, then they figured that would be the same as 2,520 spores in a cubic yard of air. Now this was two levels of a home, uh, probably 17,000 square feet, maybe times two, I don't know. Um, you can see down at the bottom that there were 20,720 inside the house and outside there were only 6,400 spores outside. So, I mean, obviously you could tell by looking at the pictures that you had a mold problem, but now we have data that tells us exactly what it is. What's interesting about this slide is um, that you don't see Stachybotrys here. So there are no toxigenic molds that were found in this particular test. And so that made it easier for us to remediate on that. So what they'll do next is they will give you a definition, description, and some of the health concerns for all of the mold spores that they found. And they kind of spell it all out there and you can read it and look it up. And uh, you know, if you have insomnia, it works well. And then the last page, they'll, they'll give you a, usually a yes or no. Is there elevated mold? Well, you could tell from the report. You don't have to be, you know, a specialist or whatever that there was elevated mold there and from the pictures, and that was yes. So here is after now. This is after we did mold remediation. Now, interestingly, um, there's still a lot of cladosporium, and that's an allergenic mold. That's one that tends to be outside more than inside, very woody related. And the reason it showed up is because on this project, there wasn't power. We ran generate, generators, things like that. And there were times where the windows were open and things we couldn't control it the way we normally did would. And uh, so there was actually a little increase in cladosporium from the first one. But you see that outside, there was still eight times as much or whatever. And so it'd be an allergenic mold that the lab people are saying, that's not an issue. You know, nobody's going outside and saying, you know, I got a mold problem and it's less inside. So there were 2,120 inside and 8,880 outside. So was there elevated mold when we left? No. All right. And this is just a quick comparison of the two before and after with the 20,000, 720, and 2,000, and outside 6,400 and 8,800 on the after. So it does vary from date to date, and uh, whatever the uh, outside environmental condition is will also have an effect. So let's just talk about removing it or cleaning it. What do you do? All right. First of all, a non porous surface. Uh, maybe you got some mold on a windowsill or something like that. Uh, metal glass, hard plastic surfaces, things like that. Um, would we have to tear out your window? No, well, we, can, we can clean it. We'll talk about that, what we might do. What about a semi-porous surface? Uh, clean it or remove it? Well, now it becomes kind of a judgment call, doesn't it? Because uh, it might be wood or it might be concrete. There might be all these little fissures and things that we have to be concerned about. And, uh, you know, that becomes a real challenge for a remediator, but we have ways that we address that. 
So then you come to a very porous surface, let's say a ceiling tile, drywall, carpeting. Um, interesting, carpeting normally doesn't grow mold. Most of it's uh, synthetic material like nylon. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't grow mold, but if there happened to be dirt or food spilled on it, then that's a food source if it got damp. I've seen mushrooms growing out of carpet. And then when we do an inspection, I always pull the carpet away from the tack strip because the tack strip is wood. And if it had gotten wet for a long time, I normally find wood there. Also, the seam tape that they use for carpeting has a paper backing on it, and lots of time mold will grow there. So we do a very thorough investigation when we arrive. All right, here's the goal, protection. All right, protection, protection. Uh, protect me, and I want to protect you. And there's all kinds of things that we do to set up engineering controls and zip walls and air scrubbers and negative air and all of this in order to control the environment while we're working there so that we don't cause any cross contamination and we don't get overexposed or overexpose you. Uh, mold rem rem remediation means to remove the mold without contamination to people in non-contaminated areas. That's very important. Um, that's probably the edge that uh, a professional company like ours has over just a general contractor. A lot of contractors have been trained on some of this and have some of the equipment needed, and we'll take that precaution. All right. What about protection? First of all, we're going to use six mil plastic to contain the area where the mold's in so it doesn't get into other areas of the home. We're going to seal up uh, air vents, things of that nature. Um, if there's anything that needs to be covered, we might cover that. And obviously, we're going to be using, you know, saws and pry bars, maybe making up uh, temporary walls, things of that nature. And then uh, comes cleaning supplies and chemicals. And again, uh, professional remediators have a lot of kind of weapons and tools to their disposal. Uh, probably the most important pieces of equipment is a HEPA vacuum and a HEPA air scrubble. Now HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Arrester. And a HEPA um, air scrubber or vacuum will remove 99.97% of microns 0.3 or larger. Remember how big a spore was? Five microns. So there's a series of three stages of filters in these uh, pieces of equipment. There's a stage one filter, kind of like your furnace filter. Then there's a stage two with a real deep pleated filter. Sometimes it can be carbon impregnated. So if there's an odor issue. And then the big one is a big cylinder and uh, it's a couple hundred dollars, but that's the HEPA uh, filter in it. And that catches all of the particulates 0.3 of a micron or larger. The HEPA filter actually came out of early 1940 when they were making the atomic bomb, and they came up with this particular form of filtration while they were working on it so that uh, people weren't exposed to radiation and other issues. So it's something that's been around a long time. And then when we use a vacuum, we also use it with a HEPA filter in it. So as it exhausts, it doesn't just blow the spores back into the air, but it pulls them all out of that exhaust on, on the HEPA vacuum. Here you can actually see, um, this is kind of how we do it. And you can see the technician there, he's got his Tyvek suit on. Um, he's got a half face uh, respirator on. He's got his eye protection on. He's got hood and boots. He's got gloves on, and he's using a, a, a really interesting tool called a cat saw. And basically, that saw's depth can be set to the depth of the drywall so that we don't go through any utilities or anything of that nature. And you can see the hose coming out the top. Well, that's actually connected to a HEPA vacuum. So when we go in and do demolition, it's almost dustless. And uh, that makes a big difference as far as cleanup and as far, again, as potentially cross-contamination while we're doing the remediation. All right, so there's two fundamental steps here that we want to follow or use. One is just HEPA demolition. 
kind of shows you that right there. We always maintain a clean work area. We we'll always remove the whatever we're, has mold on it. We go two feet beyond it to make sure that it ended somewhere back there and uh, make sure that we got it all. And that might be just with something like the cat saw I showed you, or maybe somebody's holding the HEPA vacuum while another technician is using a, uh, some kind of a saw or something to open things up. And then the other feature, the other way, and this many times the hygienist requires basically a sandwich. You HEPA vacuum, then you damp wipe it with an antimicrobial, and then you HEPA vacuum it again. Uh, I mentioned that there's visible and invisible mold. Well, the HEPA vacuuming is actually going to remove anything that you can't see that might become airborne before we start uh, going at it and kind of disrupting it. And then damp wiping it down a microbial and then coming back and HEPA vacuuming it again. So obviously it's labor intensive. Um, there's a number of procedures. It's not cheap. Um, but again, if your insurance covers it normally, uh, I know my insurance company, I won't tell you who it is, used to have a $5,000 minimum on it. And that helped because it helped pay for the tests and things like that. And then the adjuster said, well, I'll cover the rest under water mitigation because there was a water issue. Um, mine just went up to 33,000. They just rewrote it and uh, mold is not going away and they're running into it. So they want to take care of their customers. Um, let's move on here. So small and minimal amounts of visible mold, we talked about that, like your 10 square feet or less. You know, I would still recommend that you do some kind of precaution. Now, since COVID, we're all ready, we're all used to a mask. So wear an N95 or a mask, just so if you do stir something up, you don't inhale it. Uh, you maybe could put a box window in the fan and blow it out if you think you've got something stirred up. If you're going to use your own shop vac, get a long hose, put the shop vac outside, bring the hose in, and that way you're not blowing it around that way. So there's ways just to think through that, do it yourself. Um, in an unoccupied work area, uh, that even if it's small, don't let people in and don't let them stand around and watch and certainly don't eat your lunch there. Okay. Cover the contents in the work area, see if you can seal it off from other areas and then close off the room in HVAC vents, and then do the HEPA demo or the HEPA clean on it. And you can rent this equipment. So if you feel like you want to tackle it yourself, um, you know, you can rent it for rental places or we, we would rent you the equipment also. Now let's talk about large areas of visible mold. And I'm looking at, I'm thinking about the pictures I showed you of those homes that we did. Well, we're going to be we're going to have a lot of personal protective equipment. We're going to be wearing a bio suit. We're going to have a full face respirator, uh, full face, uh, yeah, respirator with HEPA filters on it. Uh, probably some organic filters on it too, because many times the odors can be kind of a little overpowering. And then we're going to use full containment and we're going to ne maintain negative air pressure. By, ne by negative air pressure, we'll set up that air scrubber that has those HEPA filters in it. <clears throat> and we'll hook the exhaust up to an outside window. So it's pulling it 600 cubic feet of contaminated air every minute and exhausting it outside. And so that helps to keep our work area kind of balanced so that we're not overexposed with, with that. And uh, we have to maintain, we have to clean the air at least four times every hour when we're doing a mold job. Here's a picture actually of uh, some of the containment. You see at the end of the hall there, you can see the six mil wall that's been set up to isolate the area that they're working in. And then that blue box right there is an air scrubber with all those filters in it. You can see there's an exhaust tube that's coming over to another transfer station. I think this was in a hospital. And from that transfer station, we actually reversed HVC in that one area so that it could exhaust out. So a lot of precautions so that it didn't get blown all around uncontaminated areas. Here's another picture with, uh, you can see the negative air machine is actually attached to the plastic wall there right in the center at the bottom. And you can see the HEPA vacuum right in the forefront there, that silver uh, shiny looking thing. That's the HEPA filter with, or HEPA vacuum with the HEPA filter in it. 
And so we've isolated the area that was contaminated so that we don't cr cross contaminate while we're removing the mold. There's a couple other things that we have in our arsenal that are very interesting. And that is uh, uh, media blasting or soda blasting. You can use uh, baking soda in these big bins and basically they put it under pressure and you aim it at the surface and it explodes the mold off. We'll also use it in uh, houses that have smoke and fire damage and stain of that kind. And when you're done, you'll see the top of the picture there in the bottom. Uh, the top is what it looked like before soda blasting. The bottom is after soda blasting and it'll actually make it look like brand new um, lumber. So it creates a lot of, uh, you know, dust. And of course, all of that mold is just blown off and laying around. So it has to be HEPA vacuumed up and uh, we still treat it with an antimicrobial. But can you imagine trying to get rid of, you know, mold on like a attic like that before all they had were scrapers and sanders they had to do it by hand. So soda blasting is a real, uh, real help with that. I'm just going to pass on this real quick. Um, most important things to take away about all about mold tonight. All right, let's see what they are. First of all, don't let mold start growing. So, you know, you might see it someplace. Um, in the winter, the air is moist, and when it hits the outside window, it condensates. And that's just enough moisture for to see a little weeping along the window. And, you know, if you don't change your thermostat or your humidifier or whatever, um, it's going to start growing mold. So maybe just once a week kind of go around with a little bit of a uh, bleach solution or something like that and wipe them down or just dry them out as they get wet. Uh, don't cover, don't keep your curtains and shades down all the time. Um, I've seen dozens and dozens of homes that have mold all over the windows just because they keep the, the building dark. So don't let it start growing and dry it out as fast as you can. That's important. Clean and dry. All right. That's what you want to know. Clean and dry. Um, if anybody calls you and says, did you see the presentation here? What were the two key words? This is the answer. All right. Clean and dry. And you shouldn't really have um, any serious mold issues or problems. Then obviously mitigate all water damages quickly. Now, Again, most of you have insurance and insurance covers water mitigation. So don't be hesitant to do that. Um, you, you might say, well, I got a high deductible. Well, you know, compare that high deductible with what it might cost for a mold remediation project and make your decision and make it wisely. So I told you that at the end here, we'd be talking about the EPA website. And interesting, uh, this website, as you look at it, a lot of what I've told you tonight is going to sound very, very familiar. So it's just www.epa.gov slash mold slash. And a great resource for you um, uh, to do more research and investigation on it. Um, again, don't wait to mitigate. There are health issues, there are, you know, property loss and money um, issues. Uh, obviously, you as the customer are going to go through uh, things that you didn't anticipate. And then for your insurance company, it improves their loss ratio. So they're, they stand in all behind you and they support you in that. So I want to thank you for, uh, I guess, uh, joining in tonight. And again, we're here not necessarily as an advertisement or whatever, but we're available to you. As I said, we'd be glad to uh, come out and see what your issue is and uh, give you give you additional advice. Thank you. We have oh. a couple more, couple more questions for you. All right. Um, Lynn wants to know, can you use the Tylex spray for plywood to kill the mold? From what you said, the mold spores are just dormant. They don't die. Is that right. accurate? Question was, does Tylex kill the mold on, on, on wood? That is a great question, and I've got a good answer. I don't know. No. Um, <laughs> it, it makes it visually disappear. We've never done testing before and after, all right, because it's, it's expensive. So we've never done testing before and after. 
Um, we will use it on a job um, to remove that staining, but we also do the air scrubbing and the microbial wash down and the HEPA vacuuming, you know, to be thorough on it. Um, there's a product out right now that they use in attics, and it, it's it's amazing. You know, you got a black attic and you can spray on it, and it looks like brand new, um, brand new construction. And uh, but we don't know where the mold goes. That's an honest answer. Next another, question. Another question: If if mildew is growing in a shower on tile or on plastic, what's that mildew eating? Ah, uh, great. That has to eat something. Great question. Yeah. So you got mold like that first picture in your bath bathtub or in your shower or whatever. So does mold grow on ceramic? Is ceramic a food source for mold? Nope. All right. Is the grout a food source? Probably not as far as a food source. So what is it? Okay. Uh, you hear it here. It's soap scum. All right. It's whatever kind of bounced off you and is still on the wall. And that's that's enough uh, soil, I guess, to be a food source for the mold. All right. And back at the beginning of the, of the talk, Dorothy asked a question about um, mold or something that, and books that have been stored in the wet basement. Is there anything you can do to, to take care of mold or, or mildew in books? Well, again, what we're going to do if we find mold and mildew on books, um, by the way, one of the local colleges had their HVAC system collapse in the middle of summer, and uh, they had almost their whole library with what you just described there. And so we went in with large dehumidifiers and kind of dried things out and then uh, gave them procedures for cleaning them. I do know that they ended up kind of swapping out a few of them instead of putting the labor into it. Again, on that, looking at the HEPA sandwiching or whatever, um, we would advise that you get a HEPA vacuum, vacuum off any loose uh, mildew or mold that you see, and then maybe just take in the Lysol spray or something or you know rag and just wipe it down. Uh, you may want to put those books in some kind of container with some kind of an odor eater or something like that if it if it if you're still fighting with it. But that's the way we would tackle it. That's all of our questions. All right, that's all of our questions, Jean. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, this is at least the second or third time I've heard this show, and every time I learn something new, um, I have used the Tilex spray. It is unbelievably fantastic. Mm -hmm. You spray it and I've walked away. Mm -hmm. I don't rub it down. I don't wipe it off. Um, it's just amazing. <laughs> and I don't know where it goes either, but it went away. <laughs> so that's all I cared about. Did you want to show us any of the goodies you brought tonight? I can pick this up so you can quickly show us some of the fun things you brought. Well, I just had some of our personal protective equipment, this being a Tyvek suit. This one is actually impermeable or waterproof. There's times where we might have to do that because of the amount of contamination. This would be a half-face respirator and with the organic filters on it. This is a full-face respirator with uh, just the HEPA filters on it. And then I brought over here just a... This I don't is, know if it'll come any closer. Yeah, that's fine. Um, this is this is an air scrubber, and it has the big HEPA filter in it. So the air the air goes in the top and goes through three stages of filtration, comes out the back, and that's what we're doing to kind of clean the air as we go and keeping it safe for when we're working in there, and uh, giving us a good option to pass the pass the clearance test. Now, for someone like Dorothy's question, where she's got mold or mildew on her books in her basement. Does she have to go out and buy all this equipment to go and clean her basement? Well, again, I would advise that you at least wear an N95, okay? Um, if it's not a big problem, I myself would take those books out to the garage and clean them outside if so, and then the air can just carry the, the spores away, you know, so. magically go away. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Dorothy has a lovely screen in porch, so <laughs> she can at least work out there. 
and and it may not be enough, you know, mildew or mold to really affect you. But I want I would want her to be aware of that. If all of a sudden her nose starts running or she starts coughing or something like that, definitely back away from it. And are those the most common symptoms of someone who's allergic? And would you sneeze all the time or just sometimes or? Yeah, it's very subjective. Everybody it's everybody's a different, but okay. Some of the things, you know, asthma type, allergy type reactions, um, anything respiratory with your throat or nose running or eyes itching, things like that. Uh, you're probably got too much there and you need to whittle to the do project something. down okay. or call a professional. And they can call Service Master mm -hmm. or a company of your choice, but mm -hmm. we're kind of fond of our Service Master guy here, <laughs> Mr. Mold, Mr. Mm -hmm. Fun Guy. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten that joke. That was a good one. <laughs> um, and we'd like to thank you again for coming this evening and sharing your knowledge. And folks, sh you know, remember that this video is available at any time. You can go back and look at it later. Tell your neighbors, if you hear somebody saying, oh, I have mold or mildew, recommend that they go on our Facebook page or YouTube and look for the Community Homeworks classes, and you can rewatch this program. Do join us again next Tuesday at 6 o'clock. We're going to have another great class for you then about sinks and drains, um, another thing you need to know about. So hope you enjoyed tonight's program, and we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>